Hello, and welcome to the Computing Conversations column. This column is from the January 2012 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled Van Jacobson Content Centric Networking. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I am the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan. As engineers, every once in a while we need to seriously revisit our underlying assumptions and make sure that they still hold true. In terms of the best architecture for the Internet, the four-layer model based on TCP IP is pretty much accepted as absolute and unquestionable truth. Recently inter recently inter I recently interviewed Van Jacobson at Park, and we talked of a major re-architecting of the Internet to deal with the fact that it is increasingly a global content distribution system layered atop a communications model, with computers making virtual long-distance phone calls to each other. What if we took a more content-centric approach? To delve into a possible alternate future, we must first let go of the notion that the current state of the Internet architecture is right, simply because we're using it and it seems to work. If you look at how the net has evolved, it, it started as a telephone system for computers. The, the model was computers wanted to exchange data. You know, people wanted their computers to be able to exchange data. The model we had for communication for 140 years had been the phone system. So we said, OK, they want to have a conversation because communication is conversation over long distances. and so. Let's make protocols and infrastructure that allows computers to have a conversation. Uh, first cut of that, things like the ARPANET, networks that would handle different bandwidths. Uh, they didn't require all of the global clock distribution of a tel telephony network. Instead, they substituted uh, buffering. The earliest telephone systems used the dialing of a phone number to physically configure relays and create temporary physical wires that could transmit amplified analog audio signals over long distances. One crucial thing coming out of Paul Barron was uh, unlike the phone system where the communication was all about building a wire, you know, hop by hop, link by link between the two endpoints, it was basically. Uh, instructing the switching system on how to make one long wire. Uh, Paul said, don't do it that way. Just identify the endpoints and let the network take care of getting the data there. Although the ARPANET and the Internet were very different from the telephone network in their implementation and the use of the physical wires, they were similar in that the ultimate goal of TCP IP was to allow two distinct applications to call each other, get a connection, and let those applications have a conversation. This conversational model between applications was very general and allowed rich research into many different kinds of uses for the Internet. It kept the four-layer architecture pristine and avoided embedding application-specific understanding in routers. It's just completely changed the world, but the bulk of that change was didn't happen in the 70s and 80s and early 90s when the net was first growing out. It happened in the late 90s and the 2000s when the web took off. And it had nothing whatsoever to do with computers having a conversation model. It had to do with people creating and consuming content. And the web sort of showed us for the first time what happens if we leave behind this 18th century model of telephony and instead we start to look at not the wires but the information in the wires. The web gave us a way to name information and REST style web services gave us a namespace for data as content. Today we enter a URL into our browser to indicate what we want instead of how to get it. We layer the HTTP protocol atop a conversational model but as moving data and content becomes the dominant use of Internet infrastructure, perhaps the conversational model is becoming our limiting factor. We're having massive scaling problems today trying to join together 
with a very information-centric web model with a very host-centric TCP IP model. Look at what it takes to build something like YouTube. So you can create videos, you can put them on your own website, and you have to pray that they never get popular. Because if they get popular, your ISP is almost immediately going to shut you down because your link will be completely saturated. You know, what we used to call a slash dot effect. But uh, some flash crowd is going to show up and just blow you away. That's intrinsic to the conversational model, right? We, we don't do broadcast TV by making phone calls to a TV station, right? That, there's no way that you could scale that. We broadcast it out to everybody who wants to listen, and we don't know who they are. They're not individually identified. As world-scale applications and services become the norm on the Internet, it was impossible to have a single connection from something like Google to the rest of the Internet and route all the traffic from around the world to a single network connection in a server room in Mountain View, California. For Google to function effectively, it needs many facilities around the world and many connections between Google facilities and the public internet. TCP IP is architected around the notion that the network number portion of an IP address connects to one and exactly one router in the global internet. To support world scale applications, it's increasingly necessary to lie to TCP IP about what's really happening. Now if you look at YouTube, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, all of these very heavily used services that manifest themselves to the net as an IP address, looks like a single location, but if they're a single location with hundreds of millions of users, the traffic in a conversational model always scales like the popularity, it scales like the number of consumers. And if you're doing a Twitter update or a video that wants to be seen by millions, you, you can't deploy it in a conversational model, and we spend all our time fooling the net. In a world-scale web application like Google, the destination IP address in a packet has little to do with your request's ultimate destination. The address is simply the quickest way to get the request into a nearby data center, where Google looks more deeply into the request to figure out what you want so it can virtually route it to the closest copy of the requested information. Information that's sort of qualitatively the same, it's all naming or identity information, but it's spread randomly across the whole damn packet. So we've got source and destination addresses that conventionally we think of as layer three, and so it's up at front to be used by the network layer. And then we've got ports that uh, are layer four, and so they're a little bit deeper in because they're supposed to be used by the end node for its demoxing to get you to a particular application. And then inside of that, we've got sequence numbers, which are being used when you get to the application for it to reassemble the larger unit. And inside of that, we've got URLs, which are used by uh, a higher level part of the application, the non-transport part of the application for session meaning and the like. You've just got all of this information. It's all fundamentally name information. It's what do these bits mean? Well, if you pull together the source addresses, the ports, the sequence numbers, the URLs, they all give you context for the information. They're all the name of the information. What if I say packets have a name on the front? And all of that information just gets collected to the name. And at any point in the network, you look at as much of that name as you need to look at to do your job. If just the front part will work, because all you're doing is gross level steering, just look at the front. If you need to look at more of it, it we don't have layers. What we have is a set of structured information. There's we know that we're going to be looking at different parts of it for different reasons, so we put topologically sensitive information like Amazon.com, stick that at the front, because uh, you can use that to make scalable routing tables. But when it gets there, we don't want to say there's a transport protocol and you know there's various layers. Just say, yeah, there's a job that I'm doing when I get to Amazon.com, and it requires me to look at this much. Once we switch to a naming scheme that uniquely identifies each packet or segment of content, it no longer matters where the data actually comes from. The content segment could easily come from a nearby router from, as from the originating source. Packets could then be cached throughout the network 
in the memory of the routers, and those packets could be reused for popular content. Content-centric networking is much more than caching of content. It also works well for live streams of popular data. One of the many prototype applications built on top of CCN's early implementations is a multi-user, multi-point video conferencing system. As the popularity of a live video conference or event scales, the likelihood of packet reuse increases dramatically. If you don't care where you're getting the data, if all that matters to you is what the data is, not where it comes from, then all of this memory that has to be in the network as buffering in order to, to manage the multiplexing of the network, suddenly that becomes a viable source of data. If you just cared about the data, just start going towards that place and as soon as you run into the data, okay, now you've got a copy, you're done with your distribution. Of course, it's one thing to postulate that we need a fundamental paradigm shift in the architecture, and yet another to move a new approach into broad worldwide production. Like the shift from voice to data communications from the 1960s to the 1990s, shifting data communications from a conversational model to a content-centric one will also take time and require many experiments. And like the engineering of TCP IP itself, there will likely be many versions as researchers identify new issues and use cases. The good news is that an active community is exploring CCN and its applications worldwide. The CCN community met in Sofia Antipolis, France in September 2012 with 29 presentations, 9 demonstrations, 16 poster sessions and attendees from many different organizations. You can find more information on CCN and related projects at www ccnx.org. Perhaps the next time you have a little free time while you wait for a YouTube video to buffer, you might let your mind wander and imagine for a moment how you might re-engineer the internet architecture to better handle our increasingly content-oriented use of the network. This column is from the January 2012 issue of IEEE Computer and is titled Van Jacobson Content-Centric Networking. There is supporting video material for this column that you can find in the IEEE Computer Society YouTube channel or in the IEEE Digital Library. I'm the editor of the column and I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan.